Philosophy is the self-conscious evaluation of reasons for action and belief at the most general and universal possible level. Our abilities to perform evaluations of reasons at more specific or particular levels are grounded in our abilities self-consciously to evaluate reasons at all, to know what reasons are, to know what to do with reasons, to categorize them appropriately, and so on. That is, our abilities to act and to believe based on reason are ultimately grounded in our abilities to do philosophy. In this way, as many professional philosophers believe and as a number of us tell our students and write on syllabi or teaching statements, explain to friends, acquaintances, and family members who wonder what exactly a philosopher is or argue to university administrators skeptical of the value of the oldest intellectual pursuit within the modern contemporary university, we are all philosophers. Yes, some of us are better philosophers than others, but what separates the expert philosopher from everyone else isn't that the expert philosopher is a philosopher while everyone else isn't. Instead, it's that the expert philosopher has training and substantial practice self-consciously evaluating reasons for action and belief at the most general level. What is it that's so important about the work of philosophy as to make it historically the first intellectual discipline? That is, what is it about the self-conscious evaluation of reasons that makes that activity so important? The answer references facts forced on us by circumstances outside of our control, facts whose importance to our lives we affirm and reproduce with each action we take. Specifically, you and I are the sorts of things whose lived lives whose total manifest awareness, whose interactions with the world, with other people, and with ourselves is meaningful. Our lives are meaningful not just in a normative ethical sense, although they're also meaningful in that way as well, but also in an existential sense. Our lives themselves, as well as indiv individual temporal slices of our lives, as well as the particular contents of the individual temporal slices of our lives, are important to us. Some lives or components of lives are more important to their possessors than are others. For example, a suicide's life is probably less important to her than is the life of someone who manages to keep going on. Or for further example, a person's partner or partners are probably more important to her than a rock is. But these relative rankings of importance all occur within a general field of importance. This importance and resultant structural nature of our lives gives our lives and our awareness of our lives existential weight or meaningfulness. Since philosophy is self-conscious evaluation of reasons, philosophy is in the business of critique and evaluation of meaning. Meaning's recognition, its analysis, its understanding, and its correct deployment. And since philosophy does its work at the most general possible level, philosophy is in the business of the evaluation of meaning in the most general, expansive, universal, and all-encompassing sense. What's important for our purposes here is that without philosophy, it's impossible for lives containing meaning and that are meaningful themselves to exist. Insofar as a person carries on with the project of creating her life, she does so because of philosophy. And insofar as a person carries on living a specific sort of life, a uh, philosopher or a uh, fisherman or somebody who likes to sit on the couch, or instead decides to change their life minimally or radically, she does so because of philosophy. Philosophy then is important not just in a downward justificatory sense in which the meaning of a person's life is grounded ultimately in her philosophical abilities, but also in an upward determinative sense in which a change in philosophical abilities or a change in the content of philosophical foundations necessitates a change in the meaning of a person's life. Just as changing the shape of the foundation of a house changes the structure of the house, in a more metaphorical sense, changing the shape or the structure of a person's philosophical abilities and the content of those abilities changes the structure and the content of the meaning of her life. Thus, there is no philosophical change for a person without a concomitant existential change for that person. 
an overall improvement in philosophical abilities, changes the structure and content of the meaning of a life. A change or development of philosophical positions changes the structure and content of the relevant parts of the meaning of that life. Think, for instance, of a person who's finally persuaded by arguments for the moral permissibility of abortion. Or think, for further example, of a person who becomes convinced that animals have rights that are incompatible with human consumption of meat. Or think even of a person who learns and can deploy in practice the difference between the validity of modus ponens and the invalidity of affirming the consequent. Philosophical changes are life changes. That is, philosophy is, in the most important sense, life changing. One final thing that uh, it's important for us to recognize about philosophy in this sense is that there is no such thing as individualist philosophy. Now, thankfully, most professional philosophers recognize this, and encouragingly, a growing number of young people in states whose official ideology is one of individualism and self-sufficiency and zero-sum competition also recognize this. But the project of the liberalization of public life, and that's liberalism in a as a philosophical position, not the amorphous uh, political position adopted by the centrist left, although there are uh, substantial similarities. Uh, this project of liberalization of public life begun in the early modern period, most famously by John Locke, is a project that's based in incoherence. There is no such thing as individualist philosophy because there is no such thing as individualist life, even for the desert island castaway. All thought and all action are necessarily dialogically, dialogical and constitutively dialectical. Essential normative features of both thought and action make it such that thought and action are only intelligible in terms of standards and conditions of intelligibility that cannot possibly be possessed or understood only by a single individual. Now, of course, Kant could have told us this, and Hegel could have, and Marx could have, and Nietzsche could have, and Husserl could have, and Heidegger could have, and Wittgenstein could have, and Horkheimer and Adorno could have, and many, many others. But liberalism's defenders have often managed to be both louder and less well-read than our liberalism's opponents. And it's taken the implosion of liberalism at the theoretical level since World War II, and, uh, excuse me, since World War I, and the subsequent practical crises felt by citizens of all purportedly liberal states for the, individual, for the individualism of liberalism to be revealed as not only a false god, but an impossible one. I've thus far presented philosophy in the, uh, as the broadest possible self-conscious evaluative activity, the target of which is reasons for action and belief in their most gen general and fundamental sense, specifically as manifested in terms of the meaning present in and provided by the lived lives of creatures like you and me. And philosophical activity, I've stated, by its very dialogical and dialectical nature is anti-individualist and the results of philosophical investigations or of the possession or modification of philosophical abilities is life-changing. A consequence of this picture of philosophy as all-encompassing is that philosophy can't be subjugated to or made to play a secondary role to some set of facts or other procedures external to philosophy. In fact, insofar as we're able to interact reasonably with specific and particular parts of the world that aren't directly philosophical at all, it's ultimately due to philosophy, never the other way around. That is, philosophy undergirds all reasonable action and all resultant reasonable structures, organizations, constructs, and institutions. No reasonable action, structure, organization, construct, or institution undergirds philosophy. This is one way of saying what the broad philosophical project uh, we are here to represent and explicate, philosophy without borders, is an expression and manifestation of, and that philosophy without borders takes as its guiding ethos. That philosophy, in any version of philosophy that does justice to the essence of philosophy itself, can't be made secondary to any type of classificatory scheme, division, or process of in-grouping and out-grouping. Philosophy is borderless. 
It may initially sound somewhat odd to speak of the fundamental, foundational, general, universal, and all-inclusive nature of philosophy in terms of the concept of borders, but this oddness is a mere artifact of the narrow geopolitical conception of borders that most of us employ, those of us who aren't borders theorists, uh, at least. While a geo geopolitical border is certainly a border, it's only one type of border. Other types include national borders, uh, ethnic borders, cultural borders, linguistic borders, historical borders, genre borders, administrative borders, and bureaucratic borders. In the sense of the concept of a border that I'm employing here, a broad, although entirely coherent sense, borders are always a form of subjugation, of power assertion, and oftentimes of violence. They're an insertion into a domain, realm, or space of a claim to categorical superiority within that domain, realm, or space. As we've seen, philosophy can't properly be subjugated to or made secondary to any reasons-based construct. And as such, philosophy can't be subjugated to borders of any kind, whether those borders are geopolitical, national, ethnic, cultural, linguistic, historical, genre, administrative, bureaucratic, or of some other form. In terms of the specific topic of the present conference, philosophy's necessarily public essence can't be minimized by employing any sort of border that pushes philosophy from the realm of the public into the realm of the merely private. However, as should be obvious to all of us, too often we do in fact see philosophy claimed to be present only in some walled off section of life only in some domain surrounded by linguistic, or genre, or geopolitical, administrative, bureaucratic borders. Take, for example, the thankfully dying but still nonetheless present so-called analytic continental distinction that there are fundamentally different types of philosophy distinguished by characteristics no one seems to be able to articulate but that many nonetheless claim to be able to know when they see. Many of those who freely employ the border between the analytic and the continental also do so in an attempt to claim that one or the other type of philosophy is either second rate or not actually philosophy at all. Or take, for example, Richard Rorty's famous claim that philosophy is only writing about Plato or writing about people who wrote about Plato or writing about people who wrote about people who wrote about Plato. Or, Take the apparently widespread, although nonetheless seldom articulated belief that philosophy has a specific genre, written didactic prose that appears in journals or is read at you at conferences, like I'm doing right now. In all of these cases, we have a claim that philosophy is subjugated to, and a real attempt to subjugate philosophy to, some set of reasons that are treated as prior to philosophy. Or take perhaps the most egregious and violent example in our present philosophical culture. Philosophy has become ghettoized in the administrative state that is the contemporary university. That this is true needs no more proof than that we can have a conference based around the concept of public philosophy and not find that concept completely incoherent. The story is this, philosophy is just one more discipline in the contemporary university, which has become a massive trade school whose purpose is preparing students for jobs in the capitalist state. The goodness of these university disciplines can only be measured in instrumental terms, typically in terms of future money-making prospects. My own department at the University of Colorado celebrates this fact with a television monitor hung in the hallway above the department's main office that intermittently displays a slide that that celebrates the supposed ability of a major in philosophy to result in more future earnings potential than a major in some other discipline. Nonetheless, an astute observer should point out, whatever the status of my claim that philosophy can't be subjugated to some construct claimed to be prior to philosophy, most philosophers do in fact seem to be subjugating philosophy to some construct that's claimed to be prior to philosophy. But these philosophers, are in fact still doing philosophy, so isn't that just a refutation of my claim that philosophy can't be subjugated to some construct claimed to be prior to philosophy? What's happening in almost all cases of philosophy in practice today, and what I want to suggest is our central imperative as philosophers to fight against, 
is conscious surrender to, and unfortunately, sometimes conscious embrace of, a form of inauthenticity on our own parts. Inauthenticity is a technical term for the existentialist that means, in brief, a conscious denial to oneself of one's own manifest lived situation and of one's own abilities to change one's own manifest li lived situation. The claim, then, is that even though bordered philosophy itself is an impossibility, engaging in philosophy while presenting that philosophical activity as bordered, either outwardly in words and actions or inwardly in assertions and reassurances to oneself, isn't impossible. However, this activity of bordered philosophy is pretense, understood as pretense upon brief self-conscious reflection, and so the life of the bordered philosopher is a life necessarily of inauthenticity. Now, I want to be careful here to make clear that I'm not presenting this identification of the inauthenticity of bordered philosophy as a moral condemnation of nearly all philosophers, myself included. If it's immoral to be inauthentic, then that immorality is a very special type of immorality, not the same sort as present in torture or lying or selfishness. And while a fully authentic life is certainly possible, it's almost certain that a fully authentic life has never been actual. Inauthenticity is a sin against our very natures as meaning-making creatures, but it's also a direct result of our very meaning-making nature. However, we, self-identified philosophers, have chosen a life for ourselves that places special demands on us in terms of how much inauthenticity we ought to be comfortable excusing ourselves for. We freely have chosen not only to recognize the foundational and all-pervasive nature of philosophy, but also to present ourselves publicly as examples of the philosopher. We freely have chosen a philosophical form of life, way of being, or essence, and as I noted a moment ago, it's our duty as the embodiment of the philosophic life and as public representatives of that life to make clear to ourselves and to others that philosophy is secondary to nothing, that philosophy is a result of nothing, that philosophy and the philosophic life are without borders. Now, what that means in practice is that we all must identify, deny, and work against chauvinistic impulses that would constrain philosophy to one sector of life, one nation, one language, one culture, one tradition, or one genre. It means that we must identify, deny, and work against powerful interests that demand that we act as though philosophy is a result of institutions, organizations, or constructs. It means that we must collectivize and universalize the practice and the project of philosophy, which can be difficult in a contemporary capitalist society in which most of us here would need to starve or give up practicing philosophy if some institution didn't pay us to be philosophers. But it isn't a form of inauthenticity for us to work for a university. What would be inauthentic would be to see the university as the source of philosophy, to see philosophy as just one more job amongst others. The capitalist situation that we're born into gave most of us no choice but to beg someone to give us money so, that, money so that we could stay alive. That's regrettable. But for the philosopher employed as a philosopher, there's a serious upside. We've chosen to make philosophy our lives, and someone's going to pay us to live parts of our lives within the walls of a university. We're going to be philosophers anyway, and we're now lucky enough given that capitalism is the law of the land, that we can continue to be philosophers while at work. The only danger we need to be aware of is a tendency mentally to invert the relationship between the life that we chose with the necessity that was forced on us to work. We're philosophers first, employees second. And this is merely a result of the foundational nature of philosophy. The point here, in conclusion, is that we know what philosophy is, what our choice of a life of philosophy demands of us. To pretend that our self-chosen lives or their resultant obligations are less than all pervasive is to deceive ourselves in a way that's inauthentic. Similarly, to allow philosophy to be anything less than all pervasive is to deceive ourselves in a way that's also inauthentic. The borders that threaten to do violence to philosophy and to the, and to the nature of our lives as meaning-making creatures 
are what we must be ever vigilant to protect ourselves and one another against. As philosophers and as meaning-making creatures in general, this is a lifelong project that requires creativity and interaction with an ever-expanding conception of what counts as the philosophical life. And as we're having the pleasure of learning this weekend at this conference, this philosophical life can and must manifest itself in public so that philosophy inhabits its rightful place in the lives of all people. Thank you.